Indiana really or is animal sciences and equine sciences the best route to pursue um, prerequisites for that? So kind of to discuss that, we decided last year, well, why don't we bring together the DBMs within, that are within the department? And a few of them have sat on a few selections um, here on campus, and we thought, what better people to provide you with information about the past use of animal studies and the that you can in that country. So I want to thank our panelists for being here, and I'm just going to start off um, with handing over the microphone, and maybe if you want to talk about who you are, what you're teaching in the, the department, and um, your kind of your path to DPM, and Hi, my name is Mangesh. Uh, I'm a faculty member here in the animal science department, primarily working on the main science side of things. Uh, so I, we teach, co-teach actually the principles of main science in the end level main science course. Um, then I teach the advanced main science class and I also do the seminars and help with the chapter of main science course. Um, my background is slightly different and than anything that you're going to hear from the rest of the time today. I'm originally from India. So in India, the great programs are designed in a different manner. You don't need to go to a, a college to get your degree. So you are directly going from your high school. And then just like SAT is here, there are exams for that are almost like a standardist test. And once you get a reasonably good score in that, you get admitted to the grad school. The difference is that for the, it's a six year degree program. And for the first three years of that, it's basically like the animal science program here. So you learn about the management, uh, production practices and all of that there. And the last three year focuses on the uh, clinical side of that, where we talk about diseases, treatment, and all of that, surgery and reproduction and all of that. So I did that in, started that in 2003. <laughs> I'm dating myself here. So I started that in 2003, finished that in 2009. And one of the good things about that program is that you get to do internships. As you wrap up the program, you get to do internships. So you get to do internships in clinics as well as in internships in production facilities. So I go to do internships in meat processing plants and things like that. So I kind of had an inclination to go towards that direction, but I just wanted to be sure. So I just worked for a year as a technician, as my practice for a year. And then I was absolutely sure that that's not what I wanted to pursue. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons was like, I wanted to do large animal practice and I realized that doing that, there are going to be a lot of the challenges. And some of the panelists can address those comments. I think Dr. Kurt and I have talked about this in the past as well. So maybe some of them can address from a new situation. But even in India, that large animal practice brought up a lot of challenges. So I decided to move that, move away from that. I decided to pursue a master's. So I came over to the University of Kentucky in 2010. Did my master's PhD over there. And then after I was finishing up, I got a job over here, moved over here in 2017, and be here happily ever after. <laughs> so that's my background story. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I think a bunch of you have already had me in your classes, and for that, I'm sorry. Um, I've been guest lecturing a lot this semester already. Um, no, Roman Muniz. Um, I am faculty in the Department of Animal Sciences and I'm also director of undergraduate programs. Um, I am a DBM. I was like many of you. I, I knew that I wanted to be a vet since I was fairly young. Um, we have a, a family farm in Puerto Rico. It's a dairy farm and we also have horses for pleasure. So, you know, I grew up around large animals and I knew that I wanted to be a large animal vet. Um, I did three years of undergrad in, in Puerto Rico, <clears throat> and then I, I was accepted into several vet schools, and I chose the University of Wisconsin, um, go Badgers, 
I can say that a little bit. Go, go run to um, <laughs> um, and and um, I did that honestly because they offered me a free deal. They needed minorities and they treated me as an in-state student, so that that took a bunch of money out of my tuition. So we can talk about money decisions. It's important to look at your finances when, when you are choosing where you're going to be when you grow up. Um, so after vet school, um, I knew that you know, at first I thought that I was going to have my own clinic and all that stuff. And and when I was about to graduate, I was like, mm, no, maybe I need more training. So I applied for the internship program, and I ranked CSU my number one. So they matched uh, they matched me with their program, and so I did an internship in food animal medicine and surgery. And after that, I did a master's and looking at you know, training interventions and the help of animal caretakers on their operations. And then I stayed a few more years there. And um, my mom has always said that I was going to be a teacher and I fought with her all my life and she was right, I'm a teacher. Um, so I, I still have an active license. I love, you know, working with animals, but I enjoy more working with humans here. So. I've been here um, employed in the department since 2008. And I will say, Mahesh said that he was dating himself. I finished with vet school in 2001. So uh, let's talk about dating. So I, I, I just celebrated my 20th year graduation from vet school this summer. So it's kind of crazy. And I love being here and I love interacting with all these people and with all of you. I mean, I have heart, yeah, but my body's like aging. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. So I am not a veterinarian. I only play one on TV. Okay. No, I am not. Um, is this working? Okay. Yeah, you, you got to pull me off the stage. So, so, so I'm probably the only one up here that doesn't have any veterinary training. Um, but I will give you a, a little bit of background about me. Um, I've, I've been at CSU for 22 years now, now I'm faculty, and my, it, I know several of you in the audience, and so Evo, I'm going to pick on you, sitting back there in the back, of course. Where'd I grow up? Uh, yeah, you work with us all the time, in the mornings, at night, so. Oh, no. <laughs> perspective on agriculture, but believe it or not, we were involved in agriculture out there, um, more on the labor side. And so that's kind of how I grew up. Uh, I came to CSU fortunate enough to, uh, I was very fortunate to play football here at CSU 100 years ago. That was before the required helmets. So that explains a lot about me, right? So I was, my goals in life were to play in the NFL. That's what I was going to do. So I came to CSU. And obviously that didn't work out so well. Okay. Um, and at, at some point in time, about my junior or senior year, uh, I realized that if, you know, the reason I migrated to animal sciences was I worked on dairies when I was a kid in high school, um, moving manure and haystacks and all, all kinds of fun stuff. And I realized after several orthopedic surgeries that the NFL probably wasn't my thing. So I migrated to the animal science firm because I knew how to run equipment. I knew I, I like to learn. I've always kept my grades up. And so it, it was a good fit for me. So as, as I finished my career, or my illustrious career in football, um, I worked at the research stations. It used to be here closer in town. Is everyone familiar with the Arctic facility? That I used to work at the Arctic facility, but it was in town here. That's how old I am, my head. So 
I got to you, I got to in, interact with students that were doing research projects, and so that I got in, interested in that, and so I started helping them. And and a professor by the name of Carol Knuckles, first female faculty member in the College of Ag at BSU. She was awesome and a tough, tough old lady. She was great. She took me as a graduate student. I had no clue what graduate school was. None. I knew I liked research. I knew I liked it be cattle and work with that livestock. And so as I progressed, I, I found my my passion for research and teaching. And she allowed me to teach teach her classes with her. And it was fantastic. And so then I went on, I got a PhD at North Carolina State and came back oh 22 years ago when they hired me here. And uh, I've been teaching ever since and, and really enjoy it. Now I, I I really enjoy the research and teaching aspect of it. Um, and, and part of the reason I think uh, uh, some of the things that I've, I've been in, engaged in at CSU um, have, have helped me with, with advice and students when we used to advise as faculty members. Um, but I've served on the, the Veterinary Selection Committee for uh, a long time in, in various roles, right? And so I've reviewed applicants that come in from out of state, in state, the WICHI program. And so I've had uh, a really good interaction with the, with the folks who were the best school. And so that's helped me a little bit to try to understand what, what the best school or best uh, program is looking for in students. And I've also taught some courses over there. And so um, well, I'll do my best to answer questions for you, but um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kirk here. <laughs> We're going to give you that honorary DBM. Uh, I'm Brett Kirch. I'm an instructor here. I teach necropsy, uh, ANA 2105, the anatomy class, um, swine systems, uh, the intro class for non majors. What else do I teach? No, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I got swine in there. And then we got, I think we got most of it in there. Um, I did mine a little differently. Uh, everybody, a good portion of the folks here went to med school, went straight through. Um, I went in, came out of high school, um, came up a small farm, always wanted to be a veterinarian, you know, everybody does. Um, so I got into school and I got caught into Dr. Engel's world. Uh, nutrition and I love nutrition. Um, as a matter of fact, after two years, I pretty well quit that school. I took my plan B and went straight to plan B. Um, and I did a master's in permanent nutrition at Kansas State. I did my PhD in the University of Nebraska at Lincoln Ford Sciences. Long story, but I have an agronomy degree, even though I've cleaned rooms at 4 a.m. for months. Um, so it, it's one of those situations you go with the money that uh, life happens, okay? And I was an extension specialist in Iowa, uh, and my first wife became terminally ill. And so I took off a couple of years to take care of her in her final days. And coming out of that, um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, okay? And you know, being a veterinarian has always been a part of my life, my desire. And so for me, it became a second career. I had got silly putting an application to Iowa State. I only put in one. Uh, by luck and by their stupidity, they accepted me. <laughs> so, um, you know, you got a question to Iowa State. But anyway, um, it was a great, <laughs> I can still remember. I said, I told my parents, you know, got in and decided I'm going to med school. I said, well, it's about time. So after 15 years after being out and graduating, I went back to med school. Um, I went in to do barred animal. I had primarily interest in beef, uh, maybe a little bit of small ruminant, and came out of horse bed. So I don't know how that happened. Well, there was some racetrack stuff going on. Uh, I'd go over and hang out in the large animal side of the of the school, and it was right next to equine. And there wasn't anything going on large animal, so I'd over to equine. And they had better toys. 
let's just be honest, they don't get paid as much because they got better sports. Um, I practiced um, straight up medicine for two years. Um, I was older coming out. I didn't like the two o'clock in the morning future jobs. Um, and I remember with a lot of those. And so I kind of uh, moved to New Mexico. Things didn't go right there. And so I ended up going back to the USDA in an ARS position, which is the research wing of the USDA. I was not truly a BMO, um, but I was kind of a pseudo BMO. I was there to, to take care of some of their surgery um, techniques. And so we changed some things and did some protocols for that. Um, I still got to practice in medicine, uh, which was really great. Uh, but I also got back into research. And then as a result, uh, I got a chance to come home. I grew up in Western Nebraska. And so this is, you know, just three hours from home for me. Um, so it was a great opportunity to come back here. And I've been, I uh, started out in extension here, but really love the instruction component of it. And so I've kind of migrated that direction. And so that's my life in a, in, a, in a nutshell. I started with Plan B. So everybody always talks about Plan B. Um, and I don't regret that. It's a, it's a great match for what I did when I was in practice. I always got feeding questions. I always got pasture questions. It's just part of the game. And so being well-rounded in as a practitioner is generally a good idea. I'll turn this over back to now. Hi, everyone. My name is Pablo Dinero. I'm a faculty here. I work in baby systems. And at my age, I went to vet school in another country. I'm from Chile. So I did the vet school there, which is pretty similar to what my age claimed. You work from high school and then six years. You kind of do one year of research and then you graduate. After graduation, I worked for 10 years there in daily counts. And for a random reason, there was an opportunity to come to the US to continue my education with a PhD. So I, I came uh, to Florida, University of Florida. I did the PhD there, and then I completed the residency, which is kind of a, more of a clinical training in uh, food animals, uh, medicine, and reproduction. So after these seven years in, in Florida, I moved to Texas and I was there for four years in a, in a position with Texas a and but in a satellite place doing just research. And then the opportunity to come to Colorado uh, appear and I, I was really pleased to come here because I was really wanting to have more interaction with the students being on campus. When I was there, I was just in this research center, which is very nice when you do research, but you miss this component of interacting with the students, with more faculty, the university life, which is so special. So uh, yeah, that's what uh, I've been doing. Uh, I would say I kind of also took a plan B maybe because you know I was married to kids, my home in Chile, and then I just said, or we said, do we jump to this adventure? And we say, yeah for it and we came for four years and we have been here 70 now. So. Um, I am an alumni of CSU Vet School. I did my both my undergrad and my graduate school here. I, like a lot of others, and I'm going to date you all because <laughs> I graduated in the mid 80s from vet school. So I've been around for a while. <laughs> um, when I, I, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to be a vet, uh, that was what I wanted to do growing up then. Um, but I didn't come from a farm background necessarily. Um, my grandparents had a dairy farm, and I spent summers there, but I really wanted to just be a veterinarian to help all animals. And when I came to vet school, I ended up, um, when I graduated, going into small animal practice. And I practiced for about 10 years here in Fort Collins. Um, I sort of expanded from what small animals were. I started doing exotics. And at that point in time, very few people were doing exotics and treating them. And there was very little known about 
You know, what antibiotics can you use in a snake? Well, let's find out. <laughs> so, um, so I did that for a while, um, and then sort of along the way, um, things happened, and I got out of practice for a while. I still am licensed, I still was licensed, but I took some time off to be with my family and my kids. And then when it was time to go back, um, I had I had gotten involved with a therapeutic writing program here in town, doing veterinary work for them. And so they said, you know what, you need to get more involved in us with us. And so that's sort of how I morphed into a therapeutic writing instructor along the way. I, I worked with them for a long time and eventually approached the issue to the equine sciences, which is a relatively new major at that time, and said, hey, I think your students would benefit by learning about equine assisted activities. And luckily they said yes. So since then I've been teaching classes in equine sciences about equine assisted activities for the disabled and how the horse can be a beneficial partner with that. And that's sort of where I am here now. Okay. So I'm going to ask the first question, because I can, and um, what I want you to think about is that we're going to then open it up for you all, the questions that you have for them, but I would imagine that many of you would have the same question that I'm going to ask. How many majors and minors should I pick up to like help with my uh, application to vet school? Just who wants to... And I'm asking this question because we've had quite all of the advisors have had quite a few appointments that are set with individuals that are curious about wanting to talk about picking up a major and a minor to help with their vet school applicants. What you need for vet school is your requirements for vet school. I do not have a bachelor's degree. And I was accepted the first time by several universities. You do not need a bachelor's degree. If you wanted a bachelor's degree, you could have it in architecture if you felt like it, as long as you have the pre requirements for that school. I'll say, and my colleagues here can agree or disagree with me, it's more important what your experiences are like than the major or 700 minors that you want to add to your degree, that really doesn't matter for vet school, right? If you're doing research with Dr. Engel, or if you go with Dr. Pinedo to dairy farms, or if you're working in the meat lab here, and if you volunteer for some places in Fort Collins, right, you do some stuff with assisted therapies, because that's way more important than having a major in three or four different minors. I've never looked at that when I looked at applications for vet school. I'll just echo what with, with Roman what he said. Um, th think about this from the perspective. I think most everyone sitting up here has reviewed applications for the vet school at some point in time. And think about this. There's, I don't know how many last time we get, 2,500, 3,000 applications. And everybody's, you know, has has met the prerequisites before we even get to see them, right? So that's, so try to set yourself apart a little bit. That doesn't mean you have to, you know, go do everything under the sun, but you have to think about your application and what, what interests you. And I'll just echo what, what the, Dr. Noah said, get involved and, and, and find your passion, period. And that'll, that'll shine on, on an application after, you know, when we're reading 3,000. Yeah, there's 35, 3,600 this year, so. For CSU, other schools will not be as heavy, but um, we're pretty popular around here. These pot of rocks out here it makes people want to be here. Um, <laughs> I would I would totally agree with Doug with what's been said previously. It does not matter your major. I had classmates two from interior design and one had an art degree, so it it really does not matter where you come from. And, and it's 
for the grief. Now, I will also tell you that maybe I don't touch bias. I personally think, contrary to what you may hear in advising over uh, in the stadium, that you are in the best degree for the main reason that we teach you nutrition, which you get very little in vet school. We teach you about breathing, which you'll get some in there, but it'll be more about techniques rather than the philosophy behind it. You will get husbandry, you will get animal experience here that you do not get in biology. I will tell you when I was in practice that every day I used something from my animal science degree. So contrary to what people may tell you, I think you're in the right degree. Do you have to have 10 minors? No, no, absolutely. You just need to fulfill the requirements. And I think it's been stated here pretty well um, by Dr. Engel, 3,500 applications uh, will Individually, for those of us who are doing the out of state, we'll read somewhere between 200 and 250. I can process 10 a day. So at the end of a month, I'm a little bit burnt out. Things that are going to pop you off of the sheet. Everybody has experience balance. Most. No, I shouldn't say everybody, because not everybody does. Get as much of that as you can. Get a diversity. It's, there's nothing wrong in working for one practice your whole life, but boy, it looks better that you've spent some time in other practices. There are good veterinarians and there are bad veterinarians. And I've had students come to me and say, oh, this veterinarian is wildly. And I say, eh, that actually is probably more valuable to the one that's good because you see what you don't want to be on the other side. The other thing that I would say is all of us in this room are here because we love animals. We are veterinarians because we love animals. But guess what? Schnauzers don't rise checks. It's still a human game. And anything that you can do in those 500 hours, community hours that we talked about, or 250 or whatever the number is, do something human-based. Go spend some time in a abused women's clinic or a rehab center or something where you're dealing with people in a really dire straits. There's nothing like having the horse with the front leg that now looks like an L and you've got the young lady who's been riding this horse for her whole life and is totally distraught. That a lot of what you do, um, you don't always get a lot of training in that when you get into vet school. You get some. But dealing with people in dire situations, in stressful situations, and when people have that on their application, that pops up to me right now. That is one of the things that I definitely see. And it tells me, okay, you understand that this is not just an animal game. Animals are important. They don't pay the bills. So it's still about communication. It's still about dealing with people. And so that's my recommendation on that. Maybe a small comment. Um, it is always nice when you can show consistency. Let's say you you write, I really love to be a livestock pet. If you can show that you work at some point with cattle, that that's backing you up. Or if you say, you know, I love research, and then you said, and I work in this project and this and that. Everything that you say, you know, is stronger when you have a fact to show. So I think that's also an important thing to. So, if you have a question, raise your hand, and then if the panel could repeat the question, um, or we we'll go to the um, over there, and that way we can make sure we're hearing it. So, does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask? Uh, I was going to ask you guys when did you start looking into the best school um, and kind of start thinking about that process? I'll start and I'll pan this off. Um, yeah, when did you? When did we start looking at various vet schools? Right? Is that yeah. kind of where we're coming from right now? It's been mentioned, like you know, we get you know, we just get into college and then like professors and people are kind of mentioning looking into schools 
know, not heavily, but already to kind of see what you need to engineer your four year return. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent point. Um, right now, if you're on summer vacation and you happen to go by Kansas State, stop in and take a tour. Uh, when I started looking at vet schools, um, I actually visited three, Wisconsin, Iowa State, and Kansas State. Um, I eliminate Kansas State because I didn't like the Bible. I'll be honest with you, and I've been there before. Uh, so I guess that probably has something to do with it too. But anyway, um, that's what they wanted me to take, retake microbiology. And I said, no way. <laughs> so anyway, um, right now, anytime you're near a vet school, go check it out. Each school has a different personality, a different feel. And, you know, they're not every vet school is good at everything. I mean, you know, if you want to do art and animal, there's specific schools that are very good at that Wisconsin and Iowa State because two of us are from those schools right here. But, and they are excellent with art and animal if you have an interest in all those things. Right now, don't wait. Um, I would visit as much as you possibly can and as many as you possibly can. Quickly, I was in Puerto Rico, so I, I didn't have a chance to visit vet schools. And back then, no internet with web pages to see what, what the vet schools required. So you got a, you want a book that had like all the vet schools in alphabetical order, 25 or 26 or whatever. And so I remember sitting there with my parents going like, okay, because I, I had just done the three years for the requirements. I knew what, I was in a true pre vet program. And I was like, oh, that one requires a lot more and it's really expensive, so tap the page. That's how we did it. And because Puerto Rico didn't have an in-state vet school, right? Um, I applied to seven just to make sure, right? That I didn't have all my eggs in one basket. But I would start looking at um, also today, right? So what do you have an interest? If it's an exotic, don't go to a school that doesn't have a good exotic program, right? So what's your interest, you know, more or less, and then start choosing that way. And where do you want to live? I would hate to be in a place that's super isolated because that's not who I am. So even if the vet school was the best thing, you know, your mental health matters too. So yeah, but I would start looking out. Sure, you are taking the full advantage of that program. 
So you guys mentioned that you're going to look at like your requirements and the money and like the surroundings of vet schools. What else do you look into? Because like I'm completely lost on looking at other vet schools other than here. So the question is besides money and requirements and the, the area where it's located, what other things should you be looking at? I seriously, I go back to your interest. If you're thinking of large animals, it's not every school that is throwing large animals. If you're thinking about small animals, pretty much any best school, I would think. Um, exotic, very few that have really, really good programs. So I would start thinking of your interest. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing residency, and things like that, does, does that school that you go to affect like what are our prices, the opportunities to do? I'm gonna say, does it, so the question was, does the best school that you go to, that you graduate from, affect your likelihood of getting into a residency program? Not having reviewed any of those applications ever, I'm gonna say that there has they have there has to be some way put into that, but not necessarily. If, you know, if you went to go out of state, someone from South Pole, like absolutely not. I don't. I think you make the program what you want to make the program. Um, if you went to a vet school in another country that the, this vet school doesn't know anything about, that they might be right. How can they evaluate you? But if it's an accredited vet school from the U.S. and you have been a rock star, they will consider you, I think. And it depends on who's evaluating it, to be fair, because it can be subjective. And what's that residency like? I wanted to add a couple of things on to what are some of the other things that you look at. Um, I'll just use my examples. Um, Iowa State had strong support staff. Strong support staff for students, for financial aid, for all that. They bent over backwards to help me in my special circumstances. Wisconsin did too. The Wisconsin one made a way to year. And that's that's what came down between the two differences because both of them had strong support and the state did not. And they really kind of turned me off by you, you, you make a phone call, ask a question, and you hear it around. Um, I went to immediately, um, both of those schools that I, that I compared had really strong student support, had really good admissions officers who would walk you and talk you through the process. You know, interest, absolutely, that should be number one, feel of the school, but don't overlook those other support type components of a school. Um, there's a school down south that I really get frustrated with, but we won't use any names there with A&M. Anyway. Mature students, 
I was good as actually one of those in my class. Uh, Thirty percent of the class was twenty-eight and above, and we had. I was like the fifth. I came in at thirty-four. I was like the fifth or sixth eldest. We had two. One that was sixty, two that were in the fifties, and a couple that were in forties. So there are schools that do prefer experience, and so. Um, and every school will, will weigh it heavily, but just understand that taking some time doing something else is not going to hurt you as long as you show some. If you disappear for seven years, yeah, maybe that will hurt you a little bit, but you know, doing something just in the woods of Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you make a parallel with grad school, in my experience, when the students come from you know, undergrad and work for some time, they come back to school, they are more mature, they have experience. I think that is it's a, it's a plus. And the school may you know, consider the same. Uh, I was gonna ask if you guys could go into a little bit of the application <clears throat> process to CSU that school. Um, I know there's certain logistics surrounding in-state kids, out-of-state kids applying for that, um, and me being in-state and CSU's, you know, vet school being my number one option. I was just um, wondering kind of the information surrounding that. I'm no expert, uh, but when we see those applications, they've been they've been vetted, right? So the oh, the question was. Uh, <laughs> Try to application process for CSU and you know how, how does it kind of work and what we see is they're already partitioned out into Colorado residents non-sponsored out of state and then if there's a witch year or some other program and we read if you get put in a pool right I get put in a pool of the non-sponsors of Colorado or anything everyone up here and we and the way that the way it works is we, we team up so i i am not a veterinarian so i will i will read with a clinician so there's two people reading your application we rank those um used to be we'd go get the packets and carry them back over here now it's all electronic so when you submit that it's pretty nice because i can look at it on my computer and, and review it um, before we were just moving the paper back and forth um, and then at some point in time, you sit down with the, the person you're reading and you start to rank these individuals. So that, I don't know if that's answering your question per se, but we read in groups based off of your application. So if you're a Colorado resident, you'll, you'll, there'll be people reviewing your application, two people. And then they all get together as a Colorado group and, and, and work out rankings. And those rankings aren't really based off of GPA alone. Okay, and that's I think the beauty of the way CSU does it. Or anybody else? Yeah. I don't know if your question has to do with the process of preparing for the application. Um, but even if not, hopefully this is beneficial. Start thinking of who you would want a letter of recommendation from. Um, usually you need at least one DVM there that you have hopefully worked with. Um, I Every year, and I think all of us do, I get students that hardly know me asking me to write a letter of recommendation. And I would be fair with you and I would say, I don't know enough about you to write something really good about you, right? Um, so it's important that the people who write those letters in support of your application know you and have experience with you helping them with research or handling animals or working in a clinical setting or working with people. So make sure that as you get to know professors and researchers and other people around here, that you say they would write a good letter of recommendation for me. Um, so, so think about that. So you would submit the application. You have several essays and the questions might change, right? Um, by the year, but after you write those things, then you need to also include people that would recommend you your application, and those people need to evaluate you in, on the website. I don't know if that was what you were asking. I think that your hand was first, maybe. 
I was just wondering if like the D the D D M that you're talking about for the letter of recommendation, how did he from Colorado State? No. No, I'm from Wisconsin and I write letters all the time. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, we'll okay. Sorry. Uh, well, kind of just fine. Uh, we have a letter of recommendation from a veterinarian who's not accredited in the United States. Is that can that still count under like your next of the DCM? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If the veterinarian is not accredited in the United States, would that person count? We, yeah, we wouldn't know. Uh, because, and so when I feel, um, you know, let's say that I'm writing a letter for you, um, it says, you know, from what school did you graduate? And that's all I write. So but by the time we get them, maybe if someone if someone eliminated that, I don't, I don't see, I don't see that part of the process. So I'm trying to leave the program and I was wondering if you would say, would it be more beneficial to make more time as a student or for say my college students in the college as a part of it? So will we will we students? Um, that's a great question. It's hard to 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 answer that. My in my opinion, you have an option for many vet schools to apply to in your situation. And if, if you do become a Colorado resident, my opinion here, um, you, you limit that, right? Because every, every other vet school that you would apply to in that system would then consider you out of state or non-sponsored. So in, in my opinion, I think it's good to, to stay where you're at because you're a resident of which state? Nevada. Nevada, yeah. So you're probably going to apply to Oregon State, Colorado State, Washington State, maybe even Arizona or something like that. And I, I think, in my opinion, I don't know, do you have any, uh, or Brett? Yeah, um, you know. Yeah, uh, if you're a WUI or Witchy or whatever program, yes, the WUI. A uh, WUI student um, who's going to get, uh, if you are accepted through that program, you get in state tuition basically, but coming through another state. And I think Nevada is pretty good. I think they sponsor several every year. Um, it's, it's one of those things that uh, actually, it, if you really look at the numbers, it's probably tougher to get in through the in state than it is through out of state. <laughs> Because I, I think we did the numbers last year and just looking at it, and I don't mean to discourage anybody, but there's from free pool Colorado residents, there's about 30 seats. And the reason it is, is they pull anybody who does a graduate program with Dr. Angle or somebody else on the panel here comes in as an in state. And so those other programs are pulled in through the in state. And so in many ways, it's, it's I mean, it's not easy to get in CSU period. Let's just be honest with 3,500 applications. But free CSU or Colorado residents, there's probably about 30, 35, maybe 40 seats. Um, so in many ways, that's harder than say going to a Wisconsin or an, or an Iowa State where 60 per, or 50% of all the seats have to come into an Iowa State program. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, yeah, I would just caution you. Any other uh, programs like that is it all depends on how much, how many spots your state will sponsor, right? So if it's five or ten or fifteen, and you get ranked by CSU, you get ranked by o or uh, Oregon State, and so it it is a little more complicated. And if your state has some budget issues and they only fund three positions, then you got to be in the top three of all those individual states. Does that make sense? So it is. A little tricky, but in, in, in my opinion, um, I'm mean, gonna stay where you are right now and you can cast the, the wire net because, for what it's worth, you're, you could get in state tuition in many different states. That's right. That's my opinion. Yeah, I know I'm right there. Uh, I wanted to ask about your experience in the past, like how the schools and whether or not that is quite right. Yeah, so, so there's 
several um, international schools that we actually have written letters for students um, and, and they're happily doing stuff. So, so New Zealand, we have in, in Scotland, we have in several, it's so yeah. England, there's a, yeah, and, and those. Um, so we have some other schools that um, if students go there and you wanted to be a practicing veterinarian in the United States, you would have to do an extra year here in clinics, right? So I'm thinking of some of the schools in the Caribbean. Um, but we, I mean, we are very supportive of our students looking for opportunities internationally. Um, great, you know, we have some great programs all over the world for vet schools. And so I, I don't know if you had a question about a specific school or. Yeah, it, it's, it's an awesome program. Yeah. And it's accredited from the university. Yeah. Oh, so does that, the vet, vet test, it's, you know, um, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess it's not following the question, but the, the VIMCAS, so if I understand you right, you know, are, are is are, are these schools part of this this general application program? And I don't you have to check with that school. So if you fill out the VIMCAS and it goes to multiple schools in the US, does it go to Edinburgh or wherever? Um, I, I don't know, to be quite honest with you. Prior to going strictly to instruction, I was advising for a while. And, and this last year, two of my past advisees got into one to New Zealand and one into the British um, Veterinary College. And both of them had to do individual um, applications and petition. VimCast, um, I don't, some schools do accept VimCast, but not all of them. And so I think you have to look, like Dr. Engel said, on the individual school. Um, yeah, it's it's more work. If you want to do international vet school, I really highly recommend you take cellular biology. So they almost all want that, and I think it's coming to the U.S. schools too. Yeah, I have no idea. Well, I, find out. Yeah, you may want to just call admissions over here and ask. And, and we can give you the contact yeah. that you can connect with because I have no idea on that one. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, but I um, think you can that question. Um, maybe um, you were, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the question was you're, you're receiving in state as an indigenous um, scholarship, right? Yeah. And um, does that translate into vet school? We don't know specifically. And that's a question you would have to ask. Um, you would have to ask uh, the vet school directly. Is that one over here in the right lecture? Uh, this is kind of just one question. So you had mentioned earlier some of the things that when you look at an application, like stand up to you. And a positive way would be to have been something that stands up to you as a bit more of a negative. And also, uh, the school in Barrio has to require the GRE. So if you're applying to a school that doesn't require it, just say you get it from another one that you use yourself on your application. But do you think that the DRE might help strengthen you because you have to put in the effort to study for it for those other schools? Okay, I'm gonna I'll start and I'll see if I can repeat the question. Um, first of all, does DRE help you? Uh, 
about the second first part was um, is there anything that can negatively influence your application? Um, I'll speak from my personal experience. People who just studied and didn't do much else outside of that, um, I began to question. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with studying, but that school is so much about juggling 10 balls in the air at one time. You're taking 21, 22 hours, and four of your five classes are biochem level versus that one ethics course, which may give you a little bit of a breather, but even those can get ugly, especially with spikes in the, in the hall. Or, um, yeah, I talked to you about ethics class one time. We had a fist fight. It was entertaining. Uh, the GRE, uh, you know, I think that as we go along, GRE is really good for certain things. It is not always a great predictor of your performance in best school. Um, I think you're going to see more and more schools. Uh, that schools probably eliminate that in time. Um, not everybody's going to because it does give us some numerical feel, um, but it's not always a great predictor of how you're going to do. Um, and that's that's even been a, Dr. Fernando here has been in the midst of that debate even within our department as to whether we accept the GRE. Um, I'll pass this. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Please, I want to get rid of that. Maybe just repeating what I said. You know, if you say, I, I would love to be a full animal head, but you never touch a cow, that kind of I'm not very sorry for that. Um. I don't necessarily like reading applications that when the person makes up excuses for everything. And there's an excuse for everything, right? Own things, own your history, and own who, you know, where you are right now. Um, and when people, you know, um, don't use the cliche of, I want to be a vet because I love animals. Yeah, we all love animals. But tell me what your purpose is, right? What your goals are. And I'll say this on the positive. I like seeing people that um, can juggle life, right? And still go like, yeah, this is awesome. Um, and be real. Um, it's amazing. We don't know any of these people that we're reviewing. And you can tell when something sounds a little fake versus really honest so just be you just show me who you are and tell me why you want to you know be part of the profession and how you think that you can contribute to your community but be honest i can add to that most from a graduate school applicant perspective and but when you read through applications you read through a few of them and you can say which one is genuine versus which one is the a template that you download from internet and you filled out those. So never ever go with the template. Tell your story, make yours to stand out, make yours to be unique. That's what's going to get you to the next level. If you're trying to download someone, let someone else draw and try to fill out your portions, it's never going to be unique. So make sure it's yours. You own it. If you messed up on something, if I if I failed a class, if I dropped out of school, that's okay. That happens. Just on that, be responsible, and people like to give those to when, especially when you show them what to come back and fix that. People like to, to really appreciate that, and usually they get a second chance to fix those. So don't hide those things. But if there is something in your CV or something, something in your um, transcript that says, okay, there was a dip in my performance there, on of that, explain that, and then go forward. Don't don't about that, hey, Hopefully they won't see it. <laughs> Don't take that approach. <laughs> okay, let me listen to Dr. Michael. Unless Gary wants to take my call. I'm just going to summarize. Do not bullshit on your application. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the session is supposed to end at six o'clock and then kind of hang out if you all have individual questions for folks on the panel. But I wanted to ask two really quickly. So can we talk a little bit about mental health in vet school and how you balance that and what that looks like? And then the second question, 
Um, I'm not sure if you all heard of that, but I know we wanted to talk a little bit about that tonight as well. So, mental health. What else? <laughs> Man, man, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about mental health because in, in the big picture, it's more important than facets, right? And we can talk about facets later. Um, veterinary medicine has one of the highest uh, mental health issues and suicide rates of any profession. So I take this very, very seriously. I've lost people who were my best friends because of this, of, of the issues associated with being a vet. And I don't know if it's, you know, some, some trait in, in those of us interested in vet medicine or if it's the profession that, you know, creates the perfect storm. Um, and then and we know how to do it because we take an oath to stop suffering, right? And we can, it, I'm being deadly honest here, we can translate that to humans, right? We know how to do it. We know all, we have all the skills to do it. Um, you come first. I don't care about your degrees. You come first. And if you're not healthy, you cannot help any animals or any people in the process. So you come first. And you need to study hard. And you're going to spend some nights that you don't sleep and you're not going to eat well sometimes. But you need to know when you need a break. You need to know who your support system is. And that's not family, right? Family, family in the strictest sense of the word. Family comes in many flavors. Friends come in many flavors. You need to find your people. And you need to be smart enough, wise enough, to tell someone when you need help, right? And we're all pretty smart, so we, we think that we can fool people. You're only fooling yourself. So I, it would, and, and, you know, we talk about balance and quality of life and whatever, and then you see us all like with gray hair and like, you know, running around ever like we're crazy. I have gray hair too. <laughs> but the reality is that we all remind ourselves when we need to disconnect and you need to do that with your people. And you need to let your people tell you that. And you have all of us here to tell us that. And the stresses start when you're thinking of where to apply and how to apply and where am I gonna get the money? I mentioned the financial thing. Money, it matters. Because if you can never pay a debt, that's gonna add stress to your life. And doing what you like matters. Okay, and knowing how to deal with people matters because people will tell you, well, aren't you a vet? You're supposed to help my animal, even if I cannot pay you. So you need to learn how to deal with all those stressors. You matter more than being a veterinarian. And if it's someone in your, in your family's dream that you become a veterinarian, you come to my office and you talk to me because that's not healthy. It has to be your thing. Because it's four years of punishment. <laughs> it was the best four years of my life, in, in my academic life. Seriously, I love every second of it. I study hard. I party hard. I mean, if you're a manager, <laughs> but I knew when to say enough. And you need to learn how to do that. That's an important skill to have. So come and talk to me if you ever feel kind of weird. I'm by the ASC. Just stop by. I'll just say real quick, I echo everything you've just said, but the most courageous thing you can do is ask for help. If you need something, stop by one of our offices. We're, we're not certified counselors, but we can help and get you the right help in the right place for the help. So please, please do that. But that is the most courageous thing you can do if you need help. Yeah, it's um, uh, Dr. Roman has put it very well. Uh, we've all lost friends in this um, industry. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I had kind of, hey, it's going to seem, I lost a spouse, so I had an advantage. I knew that there was something more important than going to school. There was more, there was something more important than killing myself. And you know, it was correct. It, it is four years of punishment. 
but just like her, I think academically, it is for the best years. I had a couple good PhD years too, but uh, but it was um, but it was um, it was really good. One of the things that I did is I worked very hard with not only myself but with my a lot of my classmates is setting boundaries. Saturday morning from sun up to sundown, I did not touch a pet school book. None. I went, you know, I love college football, so I watch college football in that period of time. Um, I went, I had my dog um, spending time with her. Uh, I had horses spending time with them. I worked at the Prairie Meadows racetrack in, in uh, Des Moines, about two minutes, actually. And that gave me a break from the everyday stuff. But setting boundaries, and I never went past midnight. Yeah, I figured I would rather study my butt off until midnight and get the sleep. Of course, I was older then too, you know, which when you get old, we gotta have sleep. I would do better by getting at least four to six hours of sleep than not getting any sleep and trying to cram it all in. I figured I'd do what I could, what I had, and it, it all comes down, and that all comes down to setting boundaries. That can start now in your life. Because so many times, and all of us have dealt with it here, uh, I went to, I had a student, uh, I went to the emergency room with, as an undergrad, because she had staggered herself into illness, okay? Um, all of us are here to help you. It is very easy to fall into that trap. But now is the time to start learning to set boundaries within your life. Being a veterinarian is really cool. It's the best profession, in my opinion, on the face of the earth. But it's not the only one. And it's not the most important thing in your life. You are the most important thing in your life. Set those boundaries now. Really short. Um, I think that this applies to us too. Try to balance things. You know, if you need time to do what you like. Use the time, as you said, uh, it will pay back. You will perform better. So, yeah, balance things in life. Don't go just studying. And I, I guess I would just reiterate what everybody here has said that you need to have that support system. Um, having somebody that you can sit down with and say, you know what, I had a really crappy day today, and here's why. And they're willing to listen and help you out. You gotta have that. Okay, so we're gonna end the official panel discussion now. Um, Dr. Church is really well versed in FACTIP. If you want to follow up with him about what that program is, um, I recommend that. And I hope what you'll take away is the great things that they said, but also these are your faculty members. So you are in class with them, and it gives you that idea of as we come up with more vet school questions or areas of interest or whatever, then these are your these are the faculty members that you'll be in class with. And so I think it's really helpful to like have these faces and know that they're there for you as a resource throughout your um, curriculum. Okay, so thank you very much for coming and joining us tonight. Okay.